Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Walter Reich. I'm the director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's a pleasure to invite you in from the cold. Um, we had a debate among ourselves as to whether it was good that it was cold or bad that it was cold. Uh, and we concluded that it was fate that it would be cold uh, and that what would happen would happen. I'm very happy that uh, you've been able to join us this morning. Uh, a little while ago, I spoke with uh, Maggie Williams, who is the chief of staff for the First Lady, who said that she had never been in this building before and that having come here, she felt that it was a harbinger to an, a second visit. And uh, I hope that that's true for all of you who have not been here before, that you take this opportunity to acquaint yourselves with, the, with this institution, not only the theater, but the exhibit and its uh, educational offerings. On behalf of the museum and on behalf of the Presidential Inaugural Committee, it's my privilege to welcome you to this program of speakers devoted to the theme visions of the 21st century. Each of the speakers in today's program is going to touch upon a theme related to one of the lessons that this institution was built to convey, that we can learn something from the past in order to inform the present and divert such things from happening again in the future. This was a very difficult, painful, and in some ways extremely tragic century. Uh, perhaps more tragic than any other. It was marked by terrible experiences as well as great achievements. Uh, and it's with the legacy of those terrible experiences as well as, well as the, the great achievements, I think, that uh, we are looking forward to the next century and the next millennium and uh, trying to take this legacy and carry on its message for the good and attempt to avert the problems of the bad so that we can move into the next century with uh, hope and promise and strength and robust will to make this an ever stronger country and an ever more proud democracy. We're grateful that this program will be introduced by the chairman of our governing board, Miles Lerman. He is the chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, which is the presidentially appointed board of trustees for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Mr. Lerman is a survivor of the Holocaust, as is his wife, Chris. The Holocaust, he served as a partisan fighter in the forests of Eastern Europe. He, together with his very few and woefully unarmed, practically unarmed comrades fought against the might, the full might of the German military machine. Most were killed, some survived. Thankfully, Mr. Lerman survived and came into a liberated country, Poland, after the war, the place where he was born, and together with his wife, Chris, came to America in 1947 built a new life, raised a family, built a business, and has devoted his life since then to Holocaust remembrance and education. There's no one, no one who is more responsible than Miles Lerman for the creation of this institution, for the creation of this building, this entity, uh, and for the bringing to animate life uh, of the programs and exhibitions that this building holds which can teach to all America and the world uh, the lessons of this tragic experience. So it's an honor and it's a privilege to introduce to you the Honorable Miles Lerman. Thank you, Dr. Reich, distinguished ambassadors, members of the diplomatic corps, our most honored invited lecturers, and ladies and gentlemen. It is most fitting and perhaps symbolic
at the Holocaust Memorial Museum has been chosen to be the place where on the eve of the presidential inauguration, profound Americans will gather to share with broad America their vision as to where our country is heading as we enter the 21st century. The century that we are about to conclude will be marked as the bloodiest period in the history of mankind. It will also be marked as a period of great technological and scientific breakthroughs. What remains to be judged is whether we used this progress for the betterment of humankind or perhaps the opposite. Should this be the case, then we must come to understand why. It is essential that we realize that concepts such as education, justice, technology, no matter how highly elevated these notions are, and no matter how much they reflect the great aspirations and hope it holds for mankind, we must always bear in mind that these great achievements are not neutral endeavors. The Nazi atrocities, proved that all great progress, if not handled properly, have the potential to become powerful tools of evil. It is therefore imperative for us to bear in mind that we must never cease to maintain eternal vigil. For vigilance is the price of freedom. This museum, which is a monument to remembrance, provides the perfect platform for thinking about the many dimensions of the great issues that lie ahead of us as we approach the 21st century. This museum most poignantly reminds us that scientific and technological progress must be harnessed and put to good use, otherwise it becomes destructive. To illustrate my argument, let me point you to the Hallerit machine, which is exhibited in, the, in our permanent exhibition. The Hallerit machine is the precursor of today's computers. The Nazis used this form of technology, the form of storing information, in the, to have at their finger points names and addresses of all Jews who lived in Germany and thus were able to round them up and ship them off to their death camps. Let me give you another example. The Nazis applied the advanced technology of hardening steel to build stronger crematoria which would be able to withstand the intensity of high heat and thus be able to burn thousands of human beings daily. In this museum, we come to understand why medical and genetic research must advance step in step with moral and ethical principles. Otherwise, it becomes demonic. It is here where we get to understand that the brush fires of hatred and bigotry, unless checked in time, have a tendency to spread and turn into ravaging infernos which are no longer possible to control. It is here where we also learn that bigotry and hatred consumes not only the victims, but in the final end, also consumes the perpetrators as well. This museum is a guardian of memories, bitter memories of a dark chapter in the history of mankind. These memories must be preserved and cultivated to serve as a reminder and as a warning 
these memories must become our personal moral compass. They must become the pet light to our own future. In the three and a half years since President Clinton formally dedicated this museum to the American public, 7,800,000 visitors have crossed its portals. They were Jews and Christians. They were whites and blacks, teachers and students, farmers and laborers. And all of them came away with a better understanding why it is so vitally important for human beings to be tolerant of one another. Why we must learn to accept others that are different from us, either in color, in faith, or in background. The awesome story that this museum tells must remain the focal point, the central point of our task to remember. We invoke these memories not for the purpose of fanning bitterness and distrust, just the opposite. We remember because we recognize that remembrance teaches us what obligation each and every one of us has to society that we live in today. When we remember, we come to understand that the Holocaust did not begin in Auschwitz. It did not begin in Babi Yar. The Holocaust began when judges and lawmakers empowered national leaders who openly professed their total disdain for democratic principles and the sanctity of human lives. The Holocaust began when civic leaders lacked the courage to stand up and speak their mind. The Holocaust became possible when good, decent people choose to look the other way. This is why my colleagues, the member of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council and the members of our staff are so pleased that the Presidential Inaugural Committee has designated the Holocaust Memorial Museum to be the place from where Americans will come together to deliberate our common future and our common direction as a nation. Permit me, if you please, to contemplate on this special occasion on some personal reflections. In the days when the Jewish communities of Europe were rapidly being wiped off from the surface of the earth, in the days when young Jewish men and women decided in desperation to chance an escape from the Nazi death jaws, they began forming partisan groups to resist and fight the oppressors. They were determined to die fighting instead of living as subhumans. I was fortunate to be one of them. For two years, we fought uneven battles. Small partisan groups, poorly armed, with little or no military training, locked in a with a mighty war machine which was unrelenting in its madness to put an end to the Jewish people. Little did I dare to dream in those dark days that a time would come when I would find a new home in a country that would give the remnants of the Nazi cataclysm an opportunity to rebuild our shattered lives. Little did I dream in those days that a day would come when I would be standing in the heart of historic America in the Holocaust Memorial Museum, a museum which was supported, ordained by four American presidents and voted into law by both houses of Congress. But what is most important, a museum that was totally embraced 
and supported by Americans of all walks of life, rich and poor, corporate leaders and employees, including children that often bring us their piggy banks. It costs us more to process these piggy banks than <laughs> these piggy banks contain. <laughs> but they are the most precious, the most, ex the most important gifts to us. So today, as I stand before you to bid welcome to a select group of profound Americans of the United States of America on the eve of his inauguration, on the eve of the inauguration, this, this museum of profound Americans who were invited by the President of the United States on the eve of his inauguration to use this museum as a form from where they are to share with him and with broad America, the American people, their visions of what our country should be striving for as we enter the next century. For me, this is a highly emotional moment. And my heart commends my lips to utter a prayer of gratitude for the fact that destiny has brought me, my wife, a survivor of Auschwitz, and many other survivors of the Holocaust, to the shores of America, a country that has restored in us our humanity, a country where people are respected and recognized for what they are and not who they are or what God they worship. Perhaps more than any other group, Holocaust survivors appreciate most the importance of American democracy and freedom, as well as the need to keep our country strong and vibrant. America is the leading country in the quest of liberty, equality, and individual opportunity. Yes, America may be far from being perfect, but nowhere in the world can a human being live more freely than here. So for this, we all need to be most grateful. So on this auspicious occasion, it is my fervent hope that the memories that I have just invoked will help us to understand that progress in science, progress in technology, must have a heart and a soul. It must be based on ethical principles, because without these principles, good becomes evil, and progress becomes regress. So on this note, ladies and gentlemen, I bid you welcome and let this dialogue begin. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ruth Mandel and I'm Vice Chair of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, the governing board of this museum. Thank you, Miles Lerman, for sharing with us your vision for the future and for allowing us to share your past. Your personal experiences during the Holocaust add special significance to your words and help us understand your love and respect the United States of America. As Mr. Lerman has said, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum is deeply honored to serve as the venue for reflections by six eminent thinkers about their visions for America's future. It is appropriate that we host this program since each of the themes our speakers will discuss today resonates within the museum's exhibitions. From the tragic history of the Holocaust, we seek to learn how to make our nation and the world 
a better place to live for all its people. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to review the format for this session. Our guest will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes. Following the remarks, you will have an opportunity to ask questions of our speaker. The question session will be moderated by Professor Deborah Lipstadt, Dorot Professor of Modern Jewish and Holocaust Studies at Emory University in Atlanta and a member of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. Professor Lipstadt is the author of Denying the Holocaust, The Growing Assault on Truth and Memory, and Beyond Belief, The American Press and the Coming of the Holocaust. In this museum, we learn about the extremes to which racism and prejudice can lead. The Holocaust is fundamentally about hatred, bigotry, intolerance. It's about a nation losing its moral underpinnings, promoting division, hostility, and violence among its citizens. The Holocaust serves as a lesson to all humanity that racism and bigotry carried to extremes can end in genocide. Our first speaker today is Cornell West, professor of philosophy of religion and Afro-American studies at Harvard University. Professor West's remarks are entitled, Toward an End to Racism and Prejudice. Professor West has dedicated his life to promoting racial understanding and tolerance. His writing and lecturing on issues of race and religion and on the social and political impact of these issues on American life have brought him wide acclaim. Indeed, he is one of the most sought after and respected thinkers of our time on these critical matters. Born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Professor West received his A.B. from Harvard College and later received his M.A. and Ph.D. from Princeton University, where he served for six years as director of the Afro-American Studies program. He has also taught at the University of Paris, Yale University, Union Theological Seminary, and several other institutions. Greatly impressed by his grandfather, who had been a preacher, his early years were influenced by the as I have been privileged to hear in the past, and as you are about to hear, his speaking style, formed by his erudition and his roots in the church, blends drama with a vast storehouse of knowledge. The results are always illuminating and inspiring. Professor West is the author of many books and articles. Among the most recent books are Keeping the Faith, Philosophy and Race in America, 1993, Race Matters, and Jews and Blacks, Let the Healing Begin, written in collaboration with Michael Lerner and published in five. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Cornell West. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. It's more than a pleasure and delight to be here. It is my privilege and honor and blessing. I'd like to thank my friend and sister Ruth Mandel for a very kind and generous introduction. I'd like to thank my new friend and brother Miles Lerman for sharing with us his vision. It's always good to see my friend and brother Walter Reich. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out this morning. and hope you have time to hear the other speakers as well, we do want time for public conversation, critical exchange. I want to be challenged. I want to be unsettled. I hope I will unsettle you. I wonder whether, in fact, it's a mere coincidence or even providence that I would be standing here at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> a day before, we also remember we love him so, and we miss him so. I am neither ordained nor licensed to 
Christian minister, a Malay Christian, unashamed of the Christian gospel, critique others, especially Christians, including myself, in light of that gospel. But I hope we don't confuse passionate speech with a sermon. I'm not here to preach, but I might get fired up at times. <laughs> I'd like to extend my congratulations to President Bill Clinton, so very, very kind of the inaugural committee to invite me to speak. Because in all honesty, I, uh, I didn't vote for him. And so I, uh, <laughs> I figure I'm deeply impressed with his nonpartisanship. I've had some wonderful occasions with him strikes me as a lovable, a likable human being, and I do believe deep, deep down he's got a good heart. But, uh, I, I wonder about his spine sometimes. <laughs> but I say that in part to say that it's not simply the welfare bill that upset me, but it's it's a move to the right where the vital center in 1997 looks like a conservative stance in 1977 is at the right wing in 1947. Often this Schlesinger Jr. who coined the term vital center in the 40s had something else in mind. What it is to be part of a democracy, to be able to disagree on a variety of different levels and still like the person even when he's president. To be candid with you, I first heard of the idea of the Holocaust Museum. Initially, I, I was not persuaded. I said to myself, we've yet to memorialize the crimes against humanity committed on this continent, in this country, the slaughter and conquest of indigenous brothers and sisters, the merry Indians, yet to memorialize the enslavement of people of African descent and the Jim Crow and the Jane Crow and segregation, that peculiar American institution of lynching, yet to memorialize the treatment of Mexicans and brown brothers and sisters. But I must say, after the tour with my brother Walter Reich, I changed my mind. The very way in which this particular museum was able to dwell so deeply into Jewish suffering and connect the particularity of Jewish suffering with the universality of human suffering convinced me this Holocaust Museum was indispensable for this city and this country. As you leave after you've seen the shoes and so many other results and consequences of indescribable evil. You leave with a sense that no group, no race, no class has a monopoly on suffering. And that it's petty and childish to engage in what Albert Camus called an algebra of blood trying to create some hierarchy of victims. In fact, if you take this museum seriously, <laughs> it connects us and links us as human beings. We learn the lesson of that great short story by Nathaniel Hawthorne, young Goodman Brown, that there's evil that lurks in the hearts and minds and souls of each and every one of us. And the question is whether we're willing to struggle and wrestle and grapple with that evil to push it back. I want to thank you, Brother Walt, for convincing. Because it has everything to do with race in America. Talk about race in America is not to talk about some individual prejudice and whether you have it or not. I always remind my white brothers and sisters that if there's white supremacy in me, my hunch is that there's some in you. There's male supremacy in me, homophobia in me. The question is whether I'm wrestling with it and struggling with it. 
No one of us pure, pristine, not free of spot or wrinkle. But it's very, very difficult to wrestle with the problem of evil. At the end of this century and in American civilization. Why, what do I mean by the problem of evil? Well, I begin with this wonderful quote from the great Theo, Theodore Adorno and his preface in negative dialectics. He says, a condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. The relation of truth to suffering. How can we be true to ourselves in a world of such overwhelming, unjustified suffering and unwarranted pain and undeserved harm, and unnecessary misery? To raise the question within the U.S. context, does the prevailing and predominant American will to truth often refuse to be truthful about itself because it denies, downplays, or overlooks so many forms of social misery and suffering in our midst. Brother Miles Lerman is right, 20th century. It's been a ghastly century. Horrendous century, unprecedented levels of barbarity and bestiality, and brutality. Like I could take you back to December 31, 1900, when the great Thomas Harding, the greatest English poet novelist, wrote that wonderful poem called The Darkling Thrush, initially entitled At the Centuries deathbed, reflecting on the century's corpse. He says, an aged rush, frail, gaunt, and small, and blast, beruffled bloom, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. The 20th century would be a dark century. And he was absolutely right. The Nazism at the heart of civilized Europe. Stalinism at the core of so-called emancipatory Soviet Union. European colonialism in the name of Christianity and civilization in Africa and Asia. Japanese imperialism, Korea, and Philippines, and China. The patriarchy shot through social systems across the board. The stigmatizing of gay brothers and lesbian sisters, subordinating of workers. This is not PC chit chat. We're talking about suffering in a century. 200 million fellow human beings murdered in the name of some pernicious ideology. Carnage in East Timor, carnage in Guatemala, in Tibet, in Rwanda, Idi Amin in Uganda. But a century, very difficult, if we're honest, to speak to a world weary, tired people like ourselves after this century. And yet we rightly have the audacity to say we want to renew and regenerate and reinvigorate the major countervailing force against such institutionalized hate and contempt against such arbitrary power, against such or organized deception, namely democratic practices. Weak read in the whirlwinds of our century. Democratic procedures. Weak read in the whirlwind of our century. One of the reasons why I'm here may not have voted for the president, but I highly affirm the process because as a radical Democrat, I believe in the rotation of elites. <laughs> it's true. That's very important. I believe the levels of literacy and healthcare in Cuba is beautiful, but you need to rotate. You want to be a leader. 
based on consent of everyday people. Make a Pascalian wager on the mental and moral capacities of everyday people so that they have a voice at the highest levels of those decision-making processes in those institutions that guide and regulate their lives. When it comes to race, when it comes to the vicious legacy of white supremacy in America, it's been tough. Why? In part, I think, because of what Henry James called America as a hotel civilization. Hotel civilizations have tremendous problems wrestling with suffering because they're obsessed with comfort and convenience and contentment. It's one of the reasons why Henry James left. Went to Britain and wrote his best work. He said, the culture is too thin and impoverished. It's too hollow and shallow and shadowless. But he wants to talk about darkness and thunder. When they do, like Melville, they're pushed into obscurity and die in oblivion. And yet here's these people of African descent and red folk and brown folk, whose backs in part serve as one of the pillars for the civilization, but whose suffering rendered often invisible, as the great Ralph Ellison reminds us. What is a hotel, of course, but the fusion of home and market? How American. How the sentiment the sentimental conceptions of the home and the cynical conceptions of the market makes it very difficult for such a civilization to actually believe that public interest and common good has major status. Our great literary artists remind us, don't they? The great Eugene O'Neill says, let's look at the Tyrone family and see if you can find something sentimental about it in long day's journey and tonight. Wingfield family in Tennessee Williams, glass menagerie. The younger family, Lorraine Hansberry, the raisin in the sun of the breed love family in Tony Morrison's The Bluest Eye. The Compson family in the great male oh, oh, Faulkner's uh, Sound of Fury. What are our artists telling us? We need to radically wrestle with the delusions modes of evasion and avoidance of evil in the so-called haven in the heartless world and my god the market one couldn't be more american than the valorizing of the market the high premium on the market america is so very much about the quest for liquidity and upward mobility ralph, ralph waldo emerson reminds us everything good is on the highway very american Indeed. Henry Ford says, just put them in automobiles and let them go for it. <laughs> Moving autonomous individualism, rapacious individualism. Huck says, let's, Twain says, let's keep Huck on the, the raft. Just keep moving. There's Jim staring at him. Melville says, let's keep Ahab on the Pequod, questing for what a dead end. So very American, stay on the move. William Carlos Williams, variable foot against the, the fixed foot in his poetry. Jazz on and off the beat. But is that questing a mode of evasion from wrestling with evil? That's the question. Let us never forget Democracies are very rare in human history. America's the oldest surviving democracy. Most democracies don't last that long. They tend to be short-lived. And when they begin to unravel, it has everything to do with what race symbolizes as well as enacts. Poverty and paranoia. Increasing poverty, generating escalating levels of despair. And there will never be enough police and prisons to deal with overwhelming despair. And paranoia, increasing paranoia, generating escalating levels of distrust. And that distrust shatters the body politic. It demeans and degrades the sense of being part of a public, a space in which each one of us can enter without humiliation and put forward our views and mediate our views with respect and civility. 
increasing poverty and paranoia and despair and distrust not bid well for this American democracy. When we add galloping inequality, generating escalating levels of division, class division, when we add increasing isolation, generate escalating levels of loneliness, that deep loneliness, and it's not new in America. You turn to that 13th chapter of book two of the second volume of de Tocqueville's Democracy in America entitled, Why Americans Are So Restless in the Midst of Prosperity. An interesting little chapter. Is there something about these people? They're always busy, on the move, and yet I discern within them a sadness, a vague dread, a secret disquietude. A certain spiritual crises at work. Great gas babe, uh, Scott Fitzgerald says the same thing. How do we talk about the personal and the political, the existential and the economic? necessary if we're going to talk about the 21st century and the role of America in the 21st century. I submit to you this morning that we're living in one of the most terrifying and frightening moments in the history of this nation. Never before have we had to deal with an unprecedented lethal linkage of relative economic decline, undeniable cultural decay, and a peculiar sense of political lethargy without there being an external enemy that could serve as a source of a certain kind of coming together. We're forced to look clearly and candidly at ourselves. Who are we really? What kind of people are we? What are our true priorities? People say, well, Brother West, what do you mean by relative economic decline? Isn't it true that the economy's okay? I say, well, it depends on who you ask. Top 20%, things going very well. Top 1%, euphoric. 80% <laughs> supervisory workers wrestling with stagnating and declining wages. Working poor, those who work more than 40 hours a week did not receive one penny from the federal government but still live in poverty or increasing even as a result of the new welfare bill and that's the conflict between workfare and working poor will push wages even further down. Slow, silent depression that has been ravaging chocolate cities for the last 25 years with levels of unemployment and underemployment that are not in any way reflected in the statistics of the Labor Department who do not count part-time workers looking for full-time jobs or those who've given up working. Joblessness is not the same thing as unemployment. Not reflected. The decrepit housing and the dilapidated school systems, inadequate health care and the unavoidable child care. Can we keep track of the suffering in a hotel civilization? The downsizing, the lengthening of work weeks, the exponential growth of temps, contemporary workers with less benefits, if any at all. At a time in which corporate profits are up 205% since 1980 and salaries of CEOs are up 499% since 1980. 1960, the average CEO made $41 for every $1 for the average worker. Today it's $145 for the average worker. So, Brother West, don't demonize the rich. I'm not demonizing the rich. I'm a Christian. <laughs> it's true. I don't believe in demonizing anybody. I want to keep track of their humanity, but I do want to try to tell the truth. I call it greed. Corporate and managerial greed. And it's greed that is potentially in each and every one of us if there are not mechanisms of accountability in place. That's what democracy is about. 
not just higher taxes or government spending or international competition. These are factors, but they're dependent factors. There's human will at work. There's choices being made, as it were. So when I talk about relative economic decline, I'm talking about that 80% or muddling through, or that bottom 25% who are catching hell. That relative economic decline is inseparable, but by no means identical with undeniable cultural decay. We must be very clear. We are wrestling with a feature that is characteristics of the decline of civilization going back to the Sumerians of Mesopotamia and the Egyptians of Northern Africa, and that is this. The relative erosion of the systems of caring and nurturing with a devastating impact on children. In which the ultimate non-market activity, parenting, pushed to the margins, becomes countercultural almost. Excessively altruistic. Why? Because it cuts against the grain. The market culture evolves around buying and selling and promoting and advertising that produces a market morality, hedonistic and narcissistic and a market mentality. I want pleasure, power, and property now. And I've got a little technology to make the point. <laughs> Reinforces a cold-heartedness and mean-spiritedness. We have fear of violent attack, and vicious assault, and cruel insult. And of course, we all keep in our hearts and minds and prayers and thoughts of Brother Bill Cosby and and his family. It's a human affair, living in America, James Brown would put it. What happens? Non-market values like love and care and concern and community and fidelity push to the periphery. Even in our interpersonal relations, non-market values like sweetness and kindness and gentleness and tenderness push to the margins, reinforcing the cynicism. How do we break the double bind, as it were, in a hotel civilization? Sentimentality and cynicism toward maturity. How do we give up the obsession with innocence in order to wrestle with history, reality, responsibility? Oscar Wilde says, uh, Sentimentalist is a cynic at heart. He's right. Sentimentality is the bank holiday of cynicism. Because the sentimentalist desires to have the luxury of emotion without pain for it, pleasure with no consequences, delight with no duty. And show me a sentimental culture, I'll show you cynicism if you scratch deep enough. And that's very much where we are right now in America quest for purity and innocence, and when we don't find it, we become cynical. But I'm simply here to say that there is an alternative. It's called the blues sensibility. It's called jazz sensibility. Black folk have no monopoly on it. The greatest writers of this century were neither sentimental nor cynical. Anton Chekhov, Franz Kafka, Samuel Beckett, respect reality, wrestle with it without any quest for innocence or without losing sense of possibility. The great writers of this, our own civilization, the Toni Morrison's and William Faulkner's and Thomas Pynchon's, and above all for me, John Coltrane, as an artist, provides a way out. We need more blue sensibility in America that forces us to wrestle with legacies of evil, be they white supremacy or male supremacy or vast economic inequality. And I conclude, you've been very kind. That blue sensibility consists of four quick points. That sense of history. We have to be able to say to one another, we are not a city on the hill sitting above history with some direct access to the Most High. God does not love Americans more than God loves Lithuanians or Armenians or Israelis or Palestinians or Rwandans or Ethiopians. 
that we are not a special people, but rather we are a people trying to do a special thing. And we've been fortunate at it, sustaining a democratic project. But like any civilization, come and go and ebb and flow, and if we don't renew ourselves and rededicate ourselves, we can lose it. Abe Lincoln said that to the Congress December 1, 1862, when he said, we cannot escape history. We will nobly save or meanly lose the last best hope of Earth. He didn't say on Earth. He said of Earth. These people are not representative of all. They are alongside others, but they're doing something special. Keep track of these Americans. See how they wrestle with race and class and gender. They might be able to pull off something that's never been pulled off, creating a multiracial democracy in which all everyday people's voices can be heard. Keep track of them, but they're not special. They're just doing something special. Brazilians can do it if they really want it. They're up against their history, but they could do it. They can do it in Zaire if they really wanted to do it. Americans can do it if we really want to do it. We've been able to do it better. How long will we be able to do it better? That's the question. If we don't respond with, with heroic energy, a sense of history, expanding scope of empathy, with courage, then the 21st century will be even more barbaric than the 20th as we witness the gangsterization of everyday life mediated with revitalized tribalisms all under the aegis of a global capitalism with hardly any democratic countervailing forces. What a century. If we respond, we build on the best of this very precious democratic tradition, expand it, allow that wealth to flow within constitutional constraints so people have access. They're not simply material goods have access to something so much deeper, namely a kind of spirituality, a spirituality of genuine seeking and questioning, allowing the life of the mind to become something that excites and enables and ennobles person, but also a spirituality of, of giving Compassion, that which makes life worth living regardless of how many material toys you actually have. That's part of the end and aim of a democratic project. I simply say to you today that if we keep our heads to the sky as earth, wind, and fire would remind us, we keep our hands on the plow the way Mahalia Jackson used to sing with such power and poignancy. And if we keep our eyes not so much on each other and each other's inadequacies and shortcomings, there's many of those in each of us. We keep our eyes on the prize, something bigger than us, something grander than us so we can situate ourselves in stories and narratives, go far beyond who we are as individuals. And maybe then we can affirm our humanity. Keep in mind where that term human comes from, from the Latin humanitas, the verb humando, which means to bury. We are most human when we bury our loved ones. Because you can't be sentimental. You can't be cynical. You have to connect yourself with the dead. You have to come up with some story that relates you to the corpses. The many thousands gone. Sense of history, respect for reality. Never ever allowing misery to have the last Word. And I simply say to you, those who are willing to meet the challenge of renewing democratic tradition, I'll be there with you because I'm going down fighting. Thank you so very much. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.
Thank you so very much. You're very kind. Thank you. Please don't hesitate. Questions, queries, comments. Oh, you. So gracious. My name is Deborah Lipstadt, and I'm going to moderate this session. There are two microphones on each side. If you have questions for Brother West. Uh, you can line up there and uh, ask them uh, of him. Uh, let me give you some ground rules. Uh, we have limited time, so I will ask you not speeches but questions. You may not know this, but this uh, session was simulcast in another room with 200 people, and nonetheless, there are a couple of very upset and cold people, a couple of hundred very cold and upset people outside. So at the end of this session, I will ask you to please clear the room so we can bring them in. You're welcome to join the line for the next lecture, but this way we can accommodate the greatest number of people. Uh, Cornell West has asked us to struggle with darkness, to st struggle with distress, and most of all, to struggle with ourselves. I'm reminded as I listen to you today of the story in the book of Genesis, a great newfound favorite uh, in America, of Jacob struggling with the angel. And my tradition teaches me that in essence he was struggling with himself. And it was only after he struggled with himself that he got his real name, Israel. In that spirit, let us struggle with ourselves. And in the words of the Hebrew scripture, scriptures, Come, let us reason together. I ask you for your questions, your struggle, and your reasoning. First question, yes, there we go. All right. Hello. We have sound. We get sound. Hello. That's not I enjoyed your speech. Um, my question has to deal with um, the magnitude in which we correct uh, a wrong. Um, for instance, I believe the country of Israel gets more. Um, aid from the U.S. and the continent of Africa, and you mentioned the welfare bill, excuse me, the welfare, welfare bill. So I'm wondering um, if we're trying to come together and create humanity, I see us going the opposite way, that we're not, for, we're not forcefully working to create humanity, we're working the opposite. So my question to you in terms of how can we come together if the country of Israel gets more than the continent of Africa, obviously there's something wrong there, unless that's changed, but the last time I heard you know, that to me seems a large inequity. So my question to you, how can we go about, you know, creating, um, you know, creating some equality? No, I appreciate the question, though. Uh, empirically, you're absolutely right. Israel and Egypt receive uh, uh, more money than most other regions or country. The question becomes, how do we understand the priority? We know, of course, how fragile things are in the Middle East. We know, of course, that there are histories of people being wiped out in the Middle East, so it does warrant some focus. Now, on the other hand, we know there's other spots in the world where people have been wiped out, Rwanda and so forth and so on. I think the weakness of the UN response was symptomatic of a certain weakness of will in that regard, both in the United States as well at the international level. And it has something to do with the fact that these are Africans. There's no doubt about that. That's part of the legacy of racism in both this country and the world. But I think what we need to do is to be able to engage in a discussion about these issues as relate to foreign policy in such a way that on the one hand we're able to, to get inside of the skin of those who are making the argument for the Middle East. Because the Middle East, as we know, is a very, very scary, frightening part of the world where human life is something that um, historically past and present uh, uh, is, can be viewed as very cheap on both sides of the battle. Uh, so that for me, if, if we're going to have a discussion about U.S. foreign policy, we would have to actually talk about what particular places on the globe lend themselves to that kind of possible wiping out of human life and why it is, in fact, that we don't spend enough attention to other places as opposed simply of whether we need to transfer our focus from one place to another place. My hunch is we actually need to multiply our focus in that regard. That's just the beginning of an answer to the question. Uh -huh. On this side? Yes. 
just two minutes, so uh, let's get a question. Speak, speak this, up. The struggle in life is dark. How do we begin to bring people together? Combat racism, institutionalized behaviors, hatred, and experiences that people carry that force them to make decisions based on bad kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a point in time that somehow we can come together, starting young or wherever. No, I appreciate the question. It's very important. Historically in this country, it's been a matter of trying to generate forms of organizing and mobilizing where you have visionary leadership that allow persons to come together from different ways of life to make a blow. Social motion, social movements, 1890s, 1930s, 1960s. I think it's about time again to get on the move. Um, and I think it will have much to do with progressive elites from above, revitalized trade union movement, broadly construed conceptions of race and class and sexual orientation and disabled people who are able to accent their sense of being citizens in public space, not just bears of an identity and clients of a constituency. That's the democratic dimension of these particular efforts. And it's very difficult to pull off in America. Very difficult because the, uh, the corporate and bank elites, they have such influence, tremendous power as it were. You know, you got 1% of the population owning 36% of the wealth. Sheer argument's not gonna do it. It's gonna be argument plus push, 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 but we push Lovingly and democratically. Uh, and now, now it's my turn to push, push, lovingly and democratically to ask you to clear the hall. Thank you very much. We continue with this lecture series looking ahead at the 21st century. Coming up, Nobel Peace Prize recipient Elie Wiesel 